Welcome back to Urban Outlook. I'm April Leach, and again, joining me to talk about the disparity that exists uh, between African American students and white students during this pandemic, the impact of the virus, if you will, on black students is Dr. Gilman Whiting. Again, he is an associate professor of African American and Diaspora Studies, director of the Scholar Identity Institute, and director of graduate studies there at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Whiting, before we took a break, you were we're talking about sort of, you know, this huge, this impact on students. Uh, what this means, especially if school systems decide to go online for learning, knowing that there are a number of homes of color uh, that are lacking with that technology, whether it may be actual physical computers at home or connectivity so that students can connect. And, and I guess uh, some would say, uh, you know, this whole debate about whether to go back to school. I think maybe all of us might agree that it's better for students to be in the classroom with teachers there, getting that hands-on experience face-to-face -face with somebody. Um, but we know that the, the number of cases um, is weighing heavy on other school systems, you know, making sure that they keep their kids safe. So, so how do you juggle um, what your findings are saying and the health and safety concerns that people are, are, are feeling uh, some kind of way about uh, when it comes to keeping everyone safe, not just those students, but teachers too? Well, you know, as you said at the beginning, I am a professor at Vanderbilt University. So here in a couple of weeks, I too will be entering the fray uh, as we uh, get ready to go back to school with the children. So too are university professors around the country. Some places have decided to uh, stop the semester and go totally online. As of today, we are at Vanderbilt are going back, if not hybrid or partial. And it's a daily update. So it concerns everybody including myself personally in terms of how we will handle these things whether or not um, students should go or shouldn't go we have to also consider that there's a financial motive that's going on right now uh, possibly even political mm -hmm. but the financial motive is that a lot of schools cannot exist closed that's just the bottom line so we are basically putting possibly putting lives at risk, if not even the children who seem to be somewhat resistant, but even if they contract or catch and bring it back home, then their older siblings or parents or family members are now at risk. So that is the, 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 the situation or the problem with going back and the reasoning why I think we're trying to force it back to being as normal as possible. But we've always had a situation where I've got colleagues and friends uh, in states around the country who still have children coming to school for special programming because their parents have to work or their parents are dealing with things like uh, first responders and their children have to go somewhere. So they go to the schools. So now you've got hybrid models where half the school is going in, the other half is online. And then they flip that and they reverse it. So they're trying to be very creative and very cautious at the same time. Let's face it, we never quarantined. America never quarantined. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen the viral video of the boat floating by up there in uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, you have a Canadian boat going one way and the American boat going the other way. And on the American boat, you see these blue ponchos back to back, chest to chest, 150 people standing in a place to get wet by the waterfalls. And just across the line that divides U.S. and Canada, you see six people on the boat separated and they have a limit of six people. So we in America, we never really quarantined. And so we never really dealt with this virus. So now we're asking parents who have already been stressed by taking on the kids in a new environment. You have domestic violence up at homes, and now you have teachers who are wondering, am I going to have a job tomorrow? So there's a lot of concern about getting us back to normal. How do we help parents, in this case, for this conversation, 
How do we help parents of those children in low-income environments, African-American, Latino environments, how do we help them to navigate these waters that they find themselves drowning in? That is the real question. And a lot of people want advice, and we're not getting clear information from the top, and that scares a lot of people, superintendents on down. There's no clear answer what's going to happen next. Yeah, and you you touched on it, but that whole political pressure thing, right, where there's this fear that you could risk federal dollars if you don't open your school back uh, the way it was prior to this virus. Uh, is that fair for schools to have to also face that pressure on top of this mounting health concern? Now, you're setting me up here, April. You're setting me up for an obvious answer. Of course, it's not fair. None of that is fair because, you know, the, we have to value and treasure life. I don't care how little it is. It could be two feet tall and squeak when it talks. That's valuable. Yeah. Or it can be George Floyd. It can be valuable. Every life is valuable. And what we're finding out right now is that some of the uh, folks who are sending their kids away to schools, I have a daughter who's just now graduating uh, Harpeth Hall. She's a Nashville youth poet laureate, a great writer, and her whole senior year was spent, not her whole senior year, but the second part of her senior year was spent online. That's for us who graduated, we know all the things that she's missed, but they did the best they could. And now she's going to school in fall in Europe. She can't leave the country as of now. So it's impacting my household. So I know it's impacting households everywhere across the country. A colleague of mine just told me just yesterday her daughter was going to school in D.C. and they just canceled the classes there for her. So now what happens now is her daughter has to stay home for the year. So what do you do? Well, if you have some kind of, mm, let's say, money or uh, opportunity, you can create things for your children to do. But if you don't have the financial resources, what do you do with your children then? What do you do when you have to work and have to go out there and possibly contract it yourself and your children are home with whom? So the, the, the reason behind, well, first off, the reason is the virus. That's the cause. Yeah. How we handle it, we're, we're, we're behind. We're trying to play catch up right now, April. And that's the, that's the real problem. We're trying to play catch up. And again, I just go back to saying we need to give, and this program is a great outlet for folks in the community to let people know what they can possibly do. And what I always like to say is there's power in collectivity, there's power in community. And if we can switch kids one day on and one day off, can we work out some kind of system where we have local parents uh, helping one another out? Those are some of the, the things that we can do, but right. that's going to be almost on an individual basis. Well, Dr. Whiting, always a pleasure to talk to you. Great conversation for sure, raised in some uh, interesting points. Uh, I think there's so a lot of more to discuss as far as this is concerned, that's for sure. Uh, everybody, of course, wants everybody to be safe and healthy, but we definitely want our kids to be able to learn as well. I appreciate your uh, points of view and your intel, and thank you for joining us. We will see you again next time.